Hi. I wanted to let you know that I received this um, little pamphlet of information that was put together by several people, most notably a uh, Dr. Boyles, regarding general uh, recommendations for non-prescription drug treatment uh, in patients suffering predominantly from functional or dysautonomic related symptoms thought to be in part due to mitochondrial dysfunction. The name of the um, handout is Treatment of Mitochondrial Related Functional and Dysautonomic Associated Symptoms, Diet, Exercise, and Cofactors, parenthesis, vitamins. These recommendations are general and incomplete and not likely to apply to any single patient. Medical care should be individualized and thus this section does not replace a clinical evaluation by a physician but should be used only to assist in supplementing such an evaluation. While all of these treatments can be applied at home, families should discuss these and any other treatments with their physicians prior to use. So make sure um, we adhere to that. General pr um, principles. Number one, synergy of mitochondrial related target therapy and symptom condition targeted therapy. Almost all disease is multifactorial meaning there is not one cause, but many multiple causes acting together. This is especially true regarding functional slash dysautonomic related symptoms in which mitochondrial dysfunction appears to be an important cause, although only one among many. Thus, mitochondrial treatment should not replace current or conventional therapy, but complement it. For example, in cyclic vomiting can be treated with amitriptyline, which is prescription medication, plus coenzyme Q10, parenthesis, cofactor, and parenthesis. Muscle cramps can be treated with ibuprofen, parenthesis, over-the-counter medication, and parenthesis, plus carnitine, parenthesis, cofactor, and parenthesis. And depression can be treated with Celexa, parenthesis, prescription medication, and parenthesis, plus antioxidants, parenthesis, cofactors, and parenthesis. Do not stop any currently prescribed treatments or begin any other treatments unless advised to do so by your physician. So you have to make sure that we have all the doctors on board with this because it might be something new and different and interesting, but it's, it's medical as well and we need to be cognizant of that. General principles of energy balance. In theory, it is the imbalance between energy supply and demand that is the major mechanism in which mitochondrial dysfunction causes clinical disease. Thus, any process that increases energy demand can precipitate symptoms. This is analogous to the brownouts, which can occur during times of peak electricity demand. Situations which increase energy demand sh and should be avoided as much as is practical include fever, infection, psychological stress, physical overexertion, environmental temperature extremes, alcohol, certain medications such as steroids, and fasting. Thus the reduction of factors resulting in high energy demand is in the reduction in stress. Stress cannot be avoided, right? We all know that. But families can be more aware to minimize the number of stressful factors affecting the body at a given time. Since energy demand fluctuates greatly from time to time and among various organs and tissues, disease manifestations in patients with mitochondrial disorders tend to fluctuate substantially over time and among organs and tissues as well. In turn, any process that increases energy supply can help to alleviate symptoms. Some examples are frequent feedings, exercise, coenzyme Q10, and riboflavin. During periods where demand is high, energy supply should be increased to meet the increased energy demand. Diet and nutrition. Fasting avoidance and frequent feedings. Fasting both increases energy demand and decreases energy supply, so that's a double no-no. In my experience, most but not all individuals with mitochondrial dysfunction appear to have some degree of fasting intolerance. Complications that can occur with fasting include migraine, Vomiting episodes, syncope, irritability, altered mental status, parentheses, ranging from lethargy and irritability to coma, and parentheses. More rarely, liver failure, cardiomyopathy, stroke, 
and sudden death have been noted to be associated with fasting. Since sophisticated inpatient fasting testing is not generally available, the consequences of fasting can be severe and prevention is generally benign. It is prudent to assume fasting intolerant is present and thus to avoid fasting. I myself realize that I need to be reminded to eat sometimes even when I'm not hungry. So we could probably all listen to this really carefully. Um, fasting is most often a serious problem during illness where vomiting and our lack of appetite is ongoing as often occurs with gastroenteritis or stomach flu. Increased energy demand such as that which occurs with high fever may also contribute to complications related to fasting intolerance. During periods of illness, insufficient, I'm sorry, sufficient hydration and calories should be offered frequently to try to prevent fasting or dehydration. Some options include fruit juices, parenthesis, especially very sweet ones such as apple and grape, and parenthesis, fruits, spiked electrolyte solution, for example, parenthesis, Pedialyte, add one heaping teaspoon of table sugar per four ounces, and even candy and non-diet sodas. In many children, giving carbohydrate and protein in combination is helpful in preventing the insulin-induced hypoglycemia that can follow sugar intake. Some possibilities include chocolate milk and whole grain bars with juice. If substantial symptomatology occurs, such as altered mental status, um, parenthesis, lethargy, combativeness, etc., and parenthesis, then the child should be immediately taken to a nearby emergency room, blood drawn at IV place, and D10 with appropriate electrolytes, IV fluid given at one and a half times maintenance. Laboratory tests should be obtained including electrolytes, BUN, which is a blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, BUN and creatinine together uh, give a measure of kidney function, glucose, urine dipstick, uh, specifically for ketones, specific gravity and infection, um, ALT, CKs, lipase, plasma lactate, and urine organic acids. An increase in the anion gap is often the first laboratory sign, including metabolic decompensation and fasting intolerance. Parents often ask when fasting becomes dangerous. This is a difficult question to answer for many reasons. First, younger children are more sensitive to fasting, particularly infants. Second, poor intake depletes stores so that even short fasting intervals can be dangerous. Third, some patients are simply far more sensitive to fasting than others. Experience and lab testing may help delineate what is safe in your child. Until then, the recommendations below are rough guidelines to follow. Okay, I'm going to give you the, um, we have two minutes, okay? Mini, minimum fasting intervals for infants less than four months should not fast more than four hours. Infants age five to 11 months should not fast for more than their age in months, e.g. an eight-month-old can fast up to eight hours. Children one year old through adults should not fast more than 12 hours. However, at any age, anyone who is sick or not eating well should be fed twice as often. For example, every six hours for one year old and older. If the child has a significantly decreased intake or vomiting, he or she should be fed even more frequently and or go to an ER or doctor's office. Any child who is hungry should be fed. Be concerned if in any 24-hour period the child is consuming less than half the usual calories. If the child is consuming less than two-thirds of the usual calories by the third day of illness, urine ketones are moderate or small and rising. Seek medical attention if urine ketones are large, altered mental status is present, cannot fully wake up, cannot calm down for a prolonged period, loss of abilities, etc. Difficult, rapid, or deep breathing, any other symptoms that are very concerning to you. So this is uh, part number one of a handout that I've um, been carrying around for a week, but I want to get rid of it in the sense that I turn over this information to you guys and hope that it can help. I'm going to continue to part two. Thank you so much.